Praise the Lord Jesus, everybody. Glory be to the Most High God and praise to the name of the Lord our God forever and evermore. Lord, to you be all the glory, honor, power, praise, and adoration forever and evermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. In earth, as it is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let it be done in us first, and then spread all over the earth, or all over the world. In Jesus' name, amen. In this study, praise the Lord, precious people of God. God bless you. In part one, we talked about the power of God and why is it important that we, as the church of God, walk in power. We shouldn't forget that God is all in all. We shouldn't forget that we should love Him and serve Him because of who He is. We love Him because He first loved us. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, is the most wonderful, amazing person you will ever know. So we have to know Him. And just, we need to get to know Him and just fall in love with Him because He is wonderful. He is awesome. And none is like Him. So we don't love him because of anything we can obtain from him or he can do for us. We don't love him because, even because, just say, some people, they receive Jesus because they're afraid of hell. Jesus is no fire escape, okay? And such people, if the devil manages to make them afraid of something more than hell, they will leave Jesus quickly and immediately, you know? And so... It is a relationship. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship of love between the father and his family. We need to love God more than anything. We need to want Jesus before anything. Hallelujah. But having that in our lives, having obtained that or found that, having found the Lord Jesus, Having fallen in love with Jesus, the next thing is to start getting to know Him, His goodness. And His goodness will make us to fall in love with Him even more and more and more. And then what He does to His power. We love Him because He first loved us. The Lord's power and love and goodness. But when we have gotten to this level where we love the Lord more than anybody or anything, when we want nothing before Jesus, hallelujah, then we've gotten things right and our foundation right, hallelujah. And we can continue to growing and increasing in the Lord our God, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. And so mighty works are a powerful witness that testifies to people and even to territories of our mighty God and who He is and what He does. And it breaks away the myth, the, the, the belief that people have that God is just a story, that God is just made up. The God is just, the God and Christianity is just consolation for failures. Hallelujah. But when the presence of God is there, people feel love which they have never felt before. When the power of God is there, there's real changes. There's real miracles, signs and wonders happening. Bondages are broken. People's eyes are open and now they see. You can't meet with God and remain the same. It is not possible that you will meet with God and your life will remain the same. It's not possible. Okay? Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. It is not possible. So God wants to reveal His power and His presence to us, in us, and through us. Hallelujah. You know, some people believe that God is above. And God is above in only one sense, that He is our head. 
Christ is the head of the church. He will always be above us because he's our boss. He's our commander-in-chief. Hallelujah. Any power and authority that we have, we got it from him. Without him, we're nothing. So in that sense, he is above and he will always be above. But apart from that, God is not above at all. So only in this sense, God is above, not only above us, but above everything because he's exalted, because he's high, because he is God all by himself. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, amen. He doesn't need to get wisdom or counsel from anybody or anything. He needs nothing and nobody because he is self-existent, self-sustaining. He is God all by himself. So in that sense, he is above, not only us, but above everybody and everything. Spiritual, physical, heaven, earth, hell, God is above them all. Nobody will ever be above him. But when we're talking in another sense, we need to realize real well that God if you are a born-again child of God, if you're a believer, God is not somebody up there. God is not somebody somewhere. This is what I used to believe before I knew the Lord. I used to believe that God is somebody somewhere. Because I didn't know Him. Hallelujah. But when the Holy Spirit came into my life, the Bible says he will dwell with you and he will be in you. We need to realize that by his spirit, God comes to live in us. He comes to dwell in us. We have to become the God inside mind. He is in us. God is not someone somewhere. He's in us. Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That's what many Christians don't realize. The greater one living on the inside of us. God is in us. And if we will let him, he will work in us, through us, hallelujah, in our lives. Amen. We say amen to that. Lord, we grant you full control and full Permission in the name of Jesus. Amen. What are some of the reasons why people don't get to experience the mighty works of the Lord in their lives, in and through their lives? What are some of the reasons that people, believers of course in particular we're talking about, don't get to experience the mighty works of the Lord our God in and through our lives. Of course, the promises are for believers. There are promises that God has given to unbelievers. There are promises that, that are only to believers. If you're not a believer, you're not part of the covenant of God. The promise to you as a believer is that whosoever will if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved and you will become a part of the covenant. You will become a child of God. That's the promise to unbelievers. You can be saved. You can receive the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be saved and become a child of God. And then you enter into the covenant of promise. Then you become a part of the covenant and you are no more a stranger to it. Hallelujah. And then the promises of the covenant belong to you. They are yours now. Hallelujah. But why is it that individuals and churches do not experience these mighty works that the Lord our God wants us to experience? If we have already given our lives to Christ, if we are already children of God, if we already know Him as our personal Lord and Savior, there's also a difference between being a church goer, and sometimes there's also a difference between being a church pastor 
or any other kind of a religious leader and truly knowing the Lord. So when you have known the Lord Jesus Christ personally for yourself, hallelujah, well, that changes everything. And you become a child of God and you're born again and you're saved. What are some of the reasons that are stopping things that are stopping the power of God flowing through us mightily? What are some of the reasons that some believers are not able to command mighty results or mighty works for Christ that will evangelize to territories, that will convert territories and bring them under the Lordship of Jesus. What are some of the reasons? Let's look at that. I'm going to give four or five reasons. In fact, there are five, but we could group two together and they can become four. But let's look at those uh, four or five reasons. They're important. One of the reasons why believers, why individuals are not able to command mighty works is over dependence on the strength of the flesh. We recognize our abilities, our education, our connections, technology, but do we recognize God first? Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6 it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart and not our own understanding. I know a person some years back that I was evangelizing to that person. I laid out many principles from the Word of God as best as I knew how to. And every time I would bring up something, that person will reply with, Yeah, but I think. And you know, that person was somebody who doesn't know God. But sometimes we Christians also tend to exalt what we think above what God says. This in reality, it may surprise you or it may not surprise you, but it is a real problem in the church today and in the lives of believers that we are exalting our own understanding above the Lord our God. God forbid, say God forbid. Abilities, education, connections, technology. You know somebody thinks, well, I'm very well connected. I know some very important people. So I do not think I will go down in this life. Hmm. Some people rely on technology. Some countries are so technologically developed that it seems like Christ is not relevant. That's what they have made themselves believe. Some people trust in their education. Some people trust in their business. Imagine someone with very good education and many years of experience going to look for a job. And your wife tells you, honey, before you go look for a job, let's pray. And you say, oh, what for? I mean, look at my diploma, look at my experience. Imagine someone goes to the doctor. They have some little pain here and the doctor says, well, it's nothing much, just a simple surgery, you know, and you will be all right. And the person says, all right, I'm all right. No need to pray, no need to believe. The doctor says, I'm all right, so I'm all right. Let's just go and get that simple surgery. You see, this is called dependence and even over-dependence on the strength of the flesh. This is also over-dependence on the strength of the flesh. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, leaning on our own understanding. Well, the Bible says that he will deliver you 
from the deadly pestilence. But then again, hmm, my neighbor is sick of so and so and so, and she's a Christian. And so then, with our understanding, we start reasoning against God. Why the Word of God is not true? And we start creating man made theories and so forth. When it comes to overdependence on the strength of the flesh, one of the things that have been really that has been really a problem has been indeed so much depending on our own understanding. In any situation we try to figure out what to do. And if we believe we have the solution, either through technology, through connections, through education, through medicine, then we believe everything is all right. We analyze situations and if we could figure it out, then even Christians sometimes believe that further seeking God is not necessary. But the Bible says in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 9, He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Now, if medicine is able to help us, thank God. If we can use technology as a help, thank God. If our education is also a useful help to us, any kind of certificate we hold from any school, if, he can, if it can help us in a certain areas, thank God for that. All these things are helps given us by God. These things are given us by God, but we should not replace Him with these things. He gave us those things in a way and a manner that we exalt Him above all these things. We must be able to exalt Him above all these things. We need to realize that we depend on God in this life. The Bible says in Psalm 20 verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some horses, but will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 127 in verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it but in vain. Now this knowledge seems to be lacking in many Christians. Many Christians believe that all that is needed to keep their house safe, for example, is the proper insurance and a good lock on the door. And we tend to shove God aside. We tend to leave Him aside. We tend to, probably we're really Christians, it happens unconsciously, but we just tend to really believe that God is not really relevant in every area of our lives. We can believe that he can be relevant here and there to pray for some certain issues, but not really for everything. Because we believe there is so much we can take care of ourselves. And that's the lie and the deception of devil. Because if God build not the house, they labor in vain that build it. If they labor in vain that build it means that they do have all the materials all the equipment, all the strength, all the men. In fact, everything that takes, that it takes for the building of house, it means it's available and it is there. But the Bible says that unless God build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Some Christians really need to be reminded of this. To stop relying so much on the strength of the flesh and to depend and rely heavily on the Lord our God. To stop relying and depending so much on the strength of medicine, education, technology, connections. Well, I know I have connections here and there and there and even in very hard places. Our abilities, our brains, even our like physical, you know. Well, I'm such a great athlete. I must make it in this life with my body, with my strength. Well, such a handsome mom, tall, handsome, such a beautiful lady, I must make it. Mm. 
unless the Lord build the house. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchmen wake it but in vain. We should remember this. We should remember all this. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 6, 11 and 12 says, Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of men. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. The Bible also says in James 4, 7, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Hallelujah. So we need a functional relationship with the God of heaven, not only relying on the strength of the flesh, on the on the physical and material assets and things which we have, which we possess as a person, our strength, our abilities, our talents, the things we have around us. We should look on the inside, on the God inside us. The kingdom of God is in you, the Bible says. So we're not supposed to live as Christians from the outside in. We're supposed That's how the world lives. We're supposed to live from the inside out. Looking unto God first. And that which he has deposited into us. His guidance and his direction. Hallelujah. Point number two of why some people are not experiencing the power of the God of heaven working in and through their lives. Is ignorance and disobedience to God's principles. Now, ignorance and disobedience are two different things. So you could say as well that point two is ignorance, point three is disobedience. However, disobedience comes for the most part through ignorance because we don't know what God wants us to do. We're being disobedient, or because we don't know how to do what God wants us to do, lack of understanding, or we feel like we can't obey because of certain circumstances and situations which we don't know how to overcome. So ignorance and disobedience can be very, very connected, you know, even though they are two different things in themselves. In Ecclesiastes 10.15, the Bible says, The labor of the foolish wearied every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city. So every one of them that is foolish is weary, because he knoweth not how. That's what I told you, it's the problem. We may know that something is good, we may want to obey God, but given the circumstances, we may not know how. God forbid and God help us. In Ephesians 4.18, the Bible says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Blindness causes hardship. When someone is blind, they may be standing right in front of something they need. They may be very close to where they want to be, but they can't see it. They can't see the way, they can't see the door. Because of blindness, blindness causes hardship. So there is God's way of doing things and there is the world's way of doing things. The Bible says in Isaiah 31, 1, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel neither seek the Lord. And in verse 3 the Bible says Now the Egyptians are men and not God and their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand both he that helpeth shall fall and he that is hoping shall fall down. So under, circum under certain conditions, both the helper and the one who is helped fall down. When God is against what they're doing, when the, the, what they're doing is against the principles of God, 
what when what they're following is not God, then both the one, both the helper and the one who is helped will fall down when what they're following is not God. We need to submit ourselves to learn to God, we, from God. We need to be humble enough to submit ourselves to learn from God. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and what? And he will exalt you in due time. It says also submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Before you resist the devil, you submit yourself to God. So we need to humble ourselves before God, recognize that we need him first, and recognize then that we need to learn from him and start learning from him. In Matthew 13 and verse 11, Jesus is saying, He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. If we are to walk in power and victory in this life and in this world, it has to be by the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. We need to submit ourselves to learn the ways of God. That's why God said to the pastors in Jeremiah 3.15, And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is the assignment of the preacher to feed the people with the knowledge and understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom because this is what makes for success this is what makes for success in this life knowledge and understanding and obedience that means doing to the mysteries of the kingdom doing it God's way hallelujah there could be a big truck and all you need to start that big truck up is a set of little keys. Or you could be standing in front of a huge iron gate and all you need to open that huge iron gate is a set of little keys. In case that gate is locked, you won't be able to open it. But use that set of little keys and the gate goes open right in front of you. And um, in Matthew 16, verse 19, the Lord Jesus said, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. These are the principles of the kingdom. These are the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we bind and lose by keys, by knowing the mysteries of the kingdom. You can't bind and lose without the keys. The, this is a very interesting verse in Second Timothy 2 and verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive what lawfully so it has to be done according to the principles of god it has to be done according to the laws that god has set out and he has given them to us in his word the bible and that by his holy spirit we may learn them and walk in them hallelujah that we may walk in mastery and in victory in this life producing the results that the results that God wants for us, the God kind of results, they are only produced by the keys, the mysteries of God and his presence. Then obedience. If you're if we're talking about obedience in Deuteronomy chapter seven, it says from eleven, thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. And see what happens when we do. Wherefore it shall come to pass if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them. 
that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. Verse 13, and he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep, in the land which he sware unto thy fathers to give thee. Increase. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. So, obedience is the condition. It says the fruit of your womb shall be blessed. It is one thing to have a child. It is another thing for the fruit of your womb to be blessed. In Jesus, these things are made available to us and they are made possible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Our children are blessed. And all our children shall be thought of the Lord and great shall be the peace of our children. We can stand on the promises. And then we have Deuteronomy 28. And then in verses 1 through 14, you read the blessing that proceeds from obedience. That's the condition, obedience. So, everything God wrote it, He meant it. He says in verse 12, He says, Thou shalt lend to many nations, thou shalt not borrow. So we need to obtain the grace for complete obedience in Jesus' name because obedience brings the blessing into our lives. This obedience brings the curse. That's how it is. And it has not changed. However, in His great goodness and mercy, the Lord our God, in the days of old, instituted the sacrifice system so that people could obtain some temporary atonement for their sins. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who was made a curse for us, that we may receive the blessing of Abraham. In Galatians chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And in verse 29 of Galatians, it says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. But it is obedience what activates the blessing in our lives. And it is disobedience what activates the curse. So we repent, O oh Lord, and we obtain the grace for complete obedience. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And we plead the blood, we repent. Thank you that it covers all our mistakes. But we obtain from you the grace to obey. Hallelujah. The blessing comes as a result of our obedience. And walking in the principles and laws and statutes of God, understanding and applying, of course, the mysteries of the kingdom. That's what brings the meaning. Third reason why believers don't exhibit mighty works and or excellent results in their lives, even though. Regardless, you know, the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ on the cross for us. He died to meet all our needs, all the needs of humankind, spirit, soul, and body. But some are not experiencing in their lives. It is not their experiential achievement in this life. Some are not experiencing it in this life. Why not? Reason number three, point number three, demonic oppression. Ephesians 6 and verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. It gives us the structure of the demonic kingdom here. 1 John 5.19 says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. In other words, no part of the world is spared. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 says, Wherefore we would, come, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. So what is Paul telling us here? Paul is telling us that Satan can hinder man. Satan can try and make man less effective. Satan can fight man's joy, their visibility, their influence. Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I want you to notice that in Isaiah 54, 17, the Lord gives us a wonderful promise and he says, No weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Now, it is formed and fashioned. That requires creativity and observation, okay? So Satan is also creative. And he carefully observes which part of the armor you don't have. You see, that is why um, ignorance is such a problem. And that is why disobedience is such a problem. Because when we receive light from the Lord our God and we decide to obey, then the dark areas in our lives that Satan can use disappear. But we have to remember that God has given us weapons of victory. He has given us the power of his word, the power of the word of God to overcome Satan. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. He has given us the power of the name of Jesus to use against Satan. Hallelujah. To bind him and to cast him out of our lives. He has given us the power of the blood. Because the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel. The blood of Jesus speaks of mercy. And the mercy of God covers our mistakes. Even when we fail. Even when we have not been able to follow all his principles and all his instructions. But his mercy speaks. God has given us weapons. The power of his word. The power of the name of Jesus. And the power of the blood hallelujah in the name of jesus never forget that the power of the word the power of the name and the power of the blood as weapons of victory and also instruments of deliverance reason number four why believers don't experience excellent results in the power of god in their life is that they trivialize and ignore the place of spiritual empowerment some say well this power thing is only for preachers, you know. And some, for other reasons, because of ignorance and so forth, they believe that the power of God cannot function in their lives or maybe are not interested in it or maybe just believe that whenever they need it, they can run to so-and-so preacher for the solution. In Ephesians 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We are in the days of His power. We are in the days of His power. The power of the Lord in the earth will increase in the last days. It will increase. And it will increase every time when there is hunger and man hungering and thirsting for him and seeking him for revival. Men who are ready to learn from him and obey him. Hallelujah. Men who are ready to walk in his principles and his power and his presence and cast the devil out. And uh, first and foremost, actually men who are ready to put God first in their lives. Hallelujah. Love him with all our hearts. Seek God first. 
his kingdom and his righteousness desire nothing before Jesus. In Isaiah 10, 27, this is an awesome scripture. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The yoke of bondage is not destroyed because of good intentions. It's not destroyed because you're tired of wearing it. It's not destroyed because it's been there for a long time. It's destroyed because of the anointing. And the Bible also says that the truth shall make us free. And the truth is the word of God. So deliverance comes through different ways. But we have to realize the importance of it. It is important that we are delivered. Through whichever way we're able to obtain our freedom, but we should make sure we're free in the name of Jesus. Amen. We need God's power. Why do we need spiritual empowerment? Because God's results cannot be produced by the strength of the flesh. It will take God's ability to produce God's dimension of results. Furthermore, the demand of your destiny does not require human power alone. A major part of what you need in life has to be outsourced beyond this realm. You know, for example, exercise and healthy eating, they're all good things. And I do believe that with this knowledge, that if it's not the Lord who builds the house, they that build it labor in vain. So we should realize that our trust is in God first. We don't put our trust in exercise and healthy eating. But these things help our physical bodies. And even much more importantly than this, this is something that people in today's world ignore. Ignore very massively. People, uh, people just ignore this principle. And this is that our human body needs proper rest, proper sleep. Hallelujah. Even our brain. We don't need to be occupied with things the whole of our waking time. It is very powerful and very important to have a quiet time with God. That's why they call it quiet time. But even in our day, if we are constantly occupied with something, we need, we need time for rest. We need to give our brains rest. We need to give our bodies rest. It is very important. And yet, all those physical efforts, they're good. But exercise and good food, for example, they don't cast out demons. So we need to understand this, that unless the Lord built the house, all our labor of physical things is in vain. But we're talking about here the fact that we should go and contend for this spiritual power. Not just decide that it is not important or God forbid that we don't have time for it. In Matthew twelve twenty eight, Jesus said, But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Hallelujah. Psalm 66 verse 3, Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works! Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. So the enemies submit themselves unto God through the greatness of his power. We need his power. Hallelujah. Through the greatness of his power, we need his power. Hallelujah. Spiritual empowerment was important to Jesus. The burden of God requires supernatural strength. So the Lord Jesus told the disciples, he said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. For us to obtain power, there's a place of tarrying. Hallelujah. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. 
Luke 24, 29. Hallelujah. Now, and then in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord, with one accord, in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Holy Spirit made his entrance into the earth. Hallelujah. And he gave them that spiritual empowerment. And also the manifestation of speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. As a manifestation of this power. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We need the power of God. And, you know, we should notice that the Lord Jesus never did ministry before he got empowered with this power from on high. He went to John the Baptist and he said that he should be baptized. John the Baptist was refusing to baptize the Lord Jesus. He said, no, I should be baptized of you, not you being baptized by me. But the Lord Jesus said, let it be so that all righteousness is fulfilled. So the Lord Jesus humbled himself and obeyed. Hallelujah. And he got and the Holy Spirit came and descended upon him like a dove. And the Lord Jesus received that spiritual power and empowerment. He didn't do any ministry before he was empowered by the Holy Ghost. And we should know that as men and women of God. Before we have received the anointing of the Holy Spirit, before we have received the power of the highest, which is the Holy Ghost, we have no business going and doing ministry. Moses saw the burning bush. He had the encounter with the Lord and then went to Pharaoh. So we too, before we go to Pharaoh, we, we better have seen the burning bush first. Hallelujah. Jesus himself didn't do ministry until he received that power from on high, the Holy Spirit of the Lord. And we should make sure we receive the power from on high, the Holy Spirit of the Lord, first before we go out and venture into ministry. Spiritual empowerment. So spiritual empowerment was important to Jesus. He said to the disciples, tarry ye in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit has come. And also when he sent out his disciples to minister, he gave them power. The Bible says, look at it in uh, Mark 6 and verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth two by two. And what? And gave them power over unclean spirits. And he said to them, that's in Mark 10, 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received. Freely give. We need men and women of fire, of power and of fire, who understand the dynamics and the administration of spiritual power. Because until then, our territories will continue to say that the church is irrelevant and even point fingers at us as the source of their issues and their problems so please as God sends you and honestly speaking it doesn't matter as if God sends you into full time ministry or just to evangelize to your neighbor one on one don't let the Lord only send you with just a sermon don't go only with just a sermon. Don't go only with just a sermon. Don't go in the wisdom of men and in the wisdom of men's works. Go with the word of the Lord and empowered with his power. Go with the Holy Spirit being with you, being in you, being with you, being all around you, working with you. The Bible says in Mark 16 and verse 20, and they went forth 
and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Mark 16 verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And confirming the word with signs following. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we bless your holy name forever. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs>